well-being um, extra meeting for the 3rd of March. Um, and thank you all for, uh, for, for attending. Um, it's, um, it's good. We're on, we're on Zoom again, so I think that's nearly 12 months of Zoom now. Um, folks, so if you could all um, turn the camera, cameras and mics off uh, when, uh, when you're not speaking uh, to, keep, to keep us in. In, in order, we are recording this meeting, but that's so that we can uh, purely to do the, do the minutes and for no other other, other purpose. Um, and if you want, if you've got any questions, if you can um, use your hands, and I'll try and keep an eye and Paul as well on on the chat, so we don't don't miss 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 anyone. Um, we've three excellent presentations today. We've got um, our director of public health. Um, Dr. Shadi, with um, a first ever report to us as Director of Public Health, um, concentrating on, on COVID and, and recovery and equalities. And that really is a, a, an excellent piece of, of work for us to look at, considering it's been done in these difficult times. Um, Nigel will uh, present to us the final draft of our new health and wellbeing strategy. And if we, uh, and we will then take that out for. Uh, any final comment uh, before we, we finalise it again on improving health and reducing inequalities is our, is our theme. Uh, and our third presentation, uh, last but not least, um, is Emily with our new homelessness strategy and actions, which again is done in conjunction with our borough and district colleagues. So three very meaty items uh, for which we've called uh, this special meeting because um, I certainly think, and I'm sure you all will agree, they are worthy of that and we need to get them in the public domain. So uh, if we can move on then uh, to, to apologies. Um, I um, have Russell Hardy on my list. Paul, have you any, any more, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think some of the people I was expecting apologies may have been able to join us. I know Diane Whitfield said she may be late, but I think she's on the call already. Yeah. Um, Julie Grant from NHS England, Chair, has submitted apologies for today. Thank you. Okay. Could Thanks. I submit an apology, Chair? It's yes, Jane please. Parsons. Um, I'm afraid we've got a very poorly dog, and the only time I can get a vet's appointment was three o'clock this afternoon, so I shall have to leave the meeting. Uh, okay. That's. Uh, Great, great day. To totally understand. Uh, we'd, all, we'd, all be, we'd all be doing the same. Yeah. Um, so uh, can we move on to item two, which is members' disclosure of pecuniary and non-pecuniary interests? Do we have any? No, that's fine. Then if we could move to the uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of January. Um, are there, are there um, any issues anybody wants to raise? I have none. In which case, can we take those as, as minuted and you've all seen? Yep, thank you very much. Um, and then we could move to Chair's announcements. Uh, Councillor Second. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I feel it is um, absolutely dependent on me to notify the fact that this Chair is your last meeting chairing the Warwickshire Health and Wellbeing Board. And I, I feel I absolutely want to um, express our thanks to you for the wonderful leadership that you have shown and the way you have driven forward the agenda of partnership working, of equality of understanding of all partners involved and the services that are provided and a shared agenda on that. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I was very lucky and fortunate to have had the same portfolio that you have some, um, some years ago now. And, uh, you know, we started a journey then and I can only say it has been in far more capable hands ever since. And I'm so grateful, Les, for everything that you have done for Warwickshire and all the leadership that you have shown that has driven us into a really good and strong position that um, actually many people and many other areas are looking to Warwickshire about what we've done and how we've got there. So that absolutely is down to you in combining everyone together, uh, understanding the complexities of partnership working, 
but also understanding the urgency of, of taking that leadership and doing it together. The ability now to say that Coventry and Warwickshire is as one is a fantastic achievement, really, really is a fantastic achievement. And, uh, you know, it would be a huge underestimation just to let that go without the recognition of, of what you've done. So um, I am immensely grateful. I will be incredibly sad to see you go, as I know will many, many other people. And um, we will owe you a debt for many, many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, that's much appreciated. Uh, Nigel. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Les. I um, feels kind of odd. I, it's very rare that officers get the privilege to uh, to thank members for their work. Um, but, but clearly, my, my role in the Health and Wellbeing Board gives me the opportunity for once to do that. And I just really wanted to, to add uh, to Izzy's, Izzy's thanks, really. Um, I, I'm not going to try and uh, try and comment on your 30 years of experience in the in the public sector and your contribution across everything. And I know, as well as the children's role before this, the role as health chair of health and scrut overview and scrutiny, all of those kind of things. But I did want to say a little bit about about the time that I've been here as director and uh, your contribution to the health and wellbeing board, and of course to the place forum. Um, I don't think anyone would doubt your kind of. Um, your enthusiasm, your knowledge and your commitment to the role of Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board um, and that real desire to make sure that all parties are heard, which I think is, you know, a really kind of key element. I, I know lots of people weren't here um, that are on this call around the start of the uh, the place forum, but obviously as you had a really important part in that and of course the, the concordat that, that underpins that uh, place forum too and the development of that and it, and it was really great to be at the place forum yesterday and to hear your counterparty in Coventry um, you know contra praising your contribution to the work to the whole system so it's not just about Warwickshire you know that, I, I thought that was a really um, um, telling kind of piece of thanks really in terms of the system I, I could go on about the different things that that you contributed to the year of well-being is a really good example of that I, and I keep coming back to that people keep reminding me that through social media and other forms over a million people engaged with the year of well-being and I think that is you know, a fantastic legacy um, to be to be taking away with you um, I suppose the other thing that I wanted to mention very briefly was, was you know, a recognition that you've been the portfolio holder for public health during a pandemic. Um, <laughs> not necessarily a job that everyone would be applying for. Um, but I did want to comment particularly on the member engagement board. And I think it goes back to that reflection that um, the member engagement board could have been a kind of a secretive backdoor kind of operation. There were no parameters, no guidelines. But actually, it's been a really broad, really open one with you know members from across the councils in Warwickshire um, being able to take part and contribute. And I think, again, that, that's really indicative of the approach you've taken. I'd love to talk about Good Gym and Bitter Futures and Park Runs and all the other things you've championed too, but I could take up the whole of the Health and Wellbeing Board. So I suspect I'd better stop there and say, thank you, Les. And I know that the officers in my directorate who work with you on a very regular basis will miss you. Thank you, Nigel. So, Chris. Uh, well, encore, as they say. Uh, I want <laughs> very much to uh, endorse what both Izzy and uh, Nigel have said, obviously, from my perspective within the Coventry and Warwickshire Health and Care Partnership. You've been a great ally and supporter, Les. I've particularly valued your own uh, personal style in the discussions we have and the way you've welcomed me uh, as an outsider into Coventry and Warwickshire and uh, the ability you and I have had to work together with many other colleagues. So it's a personal thanks from me for making it so easy in the work we do, but I'd echo everything that's been said. And I would stand back because um, I've had the opportunity as the partnership working has developed to see how things are in other parts of the country. Uh, and I can say this hand on heart, not just because it's this occasion. I think we're way ahead of most other areas in terms of the quality and the maturity of our partnership working. 
uh, across the NHS, local government, and indeed into the voluntary and community sector. And that stands us in good stead with the changes we know are about to be taken forward by the government in the legislation on health and uh, social care, and to put us in a very strong position to show what it really means when integrated care systems become statutory bodies. And you've contributed a great deal to that. So we'll miss you uh, hugely, but I just wanted to thank you personally and on behalf of the partnership colleagues for your own leadership and the huge contribution you've made. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Chris Bain. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, I didn't want to let you go without saying a, a big thank you on behalf of Healthwatch. Uh, I joined Healthwatch in, in 2014, and you've been a great friend and ally since day one. Um, I often think about our, our days back in 2014, 15, 16, when you and I met with John Lennon and yeah. Phil. Yeah. Robson to to talk about um, to talk about strategy and the way forward, and I think it's no exaggeration to say that you played a significant part in helping to shape the way Health Watch works now. Um, when I think of you, I think of somebody who is a consistent champion for positivity, a consistent champion for working together, and from my perspective, above all, a consistent champion for patient voice. I'm not sure that patient voice and the involvement of people in, in the development of services would be as far advanced as it is now in Warwickshire without your input. Um, so I will miss you, Les, um, and I've really enjoyed working with you. I think your, your greatest legacy will be that we won't notice all the things you did until you're not doing them anymore. And I think we will miss them. Um, so I wish you well, Les, and um, unfortunately for you, I know where you live, <laughs> so, so when we have events and we're looking for somebody to chair or speak, um, you may be hearing from us again. Thank you so much, Les. Uh, yeah, pleasure. Uh, thank you, Chris. Judy. Well, I think Les and I have known each other a, a couple, I don't know how many years, Les. Uh, Les was chairman of the district. The tens, isn't it? Tens, if not twenties, yeah. yeah. Les was chairman of the district council when I was deputy, and, and when I should have really been supporting him, uh, and Jenny, he was supporting Steve and I. Uh, he, he showed us how it should be done. Uh, and I think we've kept in touch ever since. Um, I've been put very hard and out at the district for two years, coming up for three. Again, a very, very new role for me, having been in opposition for so many years. Uh, but Les was there. I needed any advice or where do I go or, you know, what do I do? Les was there for me. Um, and I think I'd like to say thank you for the districts, for all districts. Because, you know, we don't always agree, um, but you've always tried to involve us in everything that's um, out both through officers and through um, uh, councillors. So we, we really do appreciate that. We feel we are a, a partner. We can always keep challenging you, because that's what we Quite do. Right. Uh, and always we should. So, uh, and again, I think you said something to, to Chris yesterday about, you know, um, what a good meeting and how to get it out to the public. Um I think you've always tried to do that. You've always tried to let the public know, either through us or YouTube or whatever, um, what we're doing. And I think that that's always been my philosophy. You know, we're doing it for the people, not to the people. And you've done that less. So um, I would miss you. But like Chris, I know where you live as well. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dave Parsons. Thank you, guys. Um, I mean, yes, I absolutely would like to echo everything that's been said. Uh, I think truly you have given your all in this role and uh, and that has brought results. And I think you, uh, you've got a lot to be proud of, Liz, really are. Um, one of the things I really would commend you for is your even-handedness. From our side of the, the fence, as it were, you've always been willing to accept the challenge. You've never avoided it. And you've always encouraged everyone to speak and air their views. So uh, that's so important in this sort of role. And I thank you very much for that. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Dave. Dan Stella. You're mute. Um, I'm obviously a relatively new entrant to the health and wellbeing role in my uh, role as chair of UHCW. But I really do want to thank you for the very open and frank 
way in which you welcomed me, the way in which we had very constructive discussions about NHS and local government working together. Um, and I would really like to welcome the way in which you have appreciated the work of the NHS, how collaborative and fantastically helpful you've been during this very challenging period for all of us in this public health emergency. And I think, um, you put it this way, you'll have a lot to put in your memoirs should you decide to write <laughs> any. <laughs> and but I, I, as someone who has seen, every, seen things from both sides of the fence, both from the local government side of the fence and from the NHS side of the fence, um, I think the way in which you've managed to build bridges um, between those entities, as well as between Warwickshire and Coventry, has been completely admirable. So I'll thank you very much for your personal approach to me, but also on a wider scale across the partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've no more speakers before me, which is good. Um, so can I, can I thank you all for your, your, your far too kind words? Um, when I first got involved in, in politics, um, I got involved because I wasn't prepared to stand on the outside on my, and moan. I either got in there and helped uh, to try and make a difference or I left it alone. Um, so your kind words uh, make me feel I've done a bit of that. So uh, thank you all very much. It, um, yes, I shall miss it all, um, but it's time to do something different. And uh, thank you all for support. I haven't done this on my own. It's, it's been partnerships. Um, I'm a great believer in partnerships. And if I've made them a bit better for Warwickshire, then then I've won a bit. So so thank you all very much. That's that's most kind. So we'll move on to item two, which is the Director of Public Health's annual report, uh, and welcome Sade to present her first ever Warwickshire report to us. Thank you, Sade. Thank you, Liz. I'm just waiting for it to load. Can everybody see that? Yes, I can see that. Yes, thanks. That's great. Um, just before I launch into that, I was going to make a, a really quick comment. I am personally going to miss you, Les, just because you're the first portfolio holder that I worked with as a director of public health. Uh, I remember the first time I met you, 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 I asked you what you wanted from a DPH. And you said, I don't want a DPH that fails. And I remember driving back home thinking, oh, my God, he's going to give me a tough time. And there was no, it could not be further from the truth. You have been absolutely amazing. And um, uh, whoever is going to step into the shoes has got really big shoes to fill. I don't know where you leave, but I'll ask now that I know there's a couple of people that know where you leave. Uh, so I'll, I'll, launch into, I'll launch into my report now. Uh, the first director of public health um, and, um, and a report uh, coming from me. I must say that this has been a real team effort. I've had some fantastic people in public health, in business intelligence, working on this in design that have made it happen. Um, it, it, the title is fitting uh, because it's, it's been quite an exceptional year uh, for us across the country and in Warwickshire. And you'll see why as, as we move along. Um, We've chosen to bring the report as a draft to the Health and Wellbeing Board due to the tight turnaround um, and, and due to the team working on, on COVID-19 as well. And this will allow further edits as we move along. The um, report is due to be launched on the 22nd of March alongside an online gallery which showcases the experience of living through the pandemic in uh, Warwickshire. The report itself includes um, five chapters. Uh, and uh, I will talk through some of the key highlights of, of each chapters as, as we go along. It um, begins with progress on 2019 direct public health recommendations. So the last um, DPH annual report was produced by the interim direct public health, Helen King, and the, the report was based on, um, it was entitled Working for Wellbeing in Warwickshire and focused on the impact of work on health and wellbeing uh, it is expected that further progress will be made throughout 2021 and 22, but there's been a lot of progress that has been made already on last year's recommendations. So um, all health and wellbeing organisations have signed up to Thrive at Work. Um, 
the Royal Chief Cancer Council has created a new health and wellbeing manager role. Um, wellbeing for Life relaunch in partnership with Coventry City Council is going to be um, is planned for May 2021, uh, and the Financial Inclusion Partnership have developed an action plan to try and mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups. So lots of progress has been made with recommendations that were put in in, in the last annual report. So going into the content of, of this annual report, it begins as usual, this is customary, uh, most annual reports begin with an overview of the picture of health and well-being in Warwickshire. Um, it breaks it down countywide and by district and borough. This year's chapter has a caveat, it's the, the most recently published data is delayed due to um, reporting delays and it doesn't re reflect the impacts that COVID-19 might have had. So it is likely that the uh, data, what we know about life expectancy, for example, will change as and when the data catches up uh, in the next few years. But overall, life expectancy at birth is still better in Warwickshire compared to the England average. Uh, but what we do know is that the pandemic has had a significant impact on life expectancy, uh, especially for both males and females. Healthy life expectancy at birth in Warwickshire decreased uh, but increase for females. So decrease for males, but decrease increase for females between 2016 and 2018. But having said that, healthy life expectancy for both males and females in Warwickshire uh, remains higher than the England average. Again, this chapter talks about deprivation, um, the index of, using the index of multiple deprivation that suggests that uh, Warwickshire remains relatively um, not deprived compared to most local authorities, it ranks 121 out of 151, where one is the most deprived and 151 is the least deprived. Uh, but what we have found is that six more areas in Warwickshire are now in the top 30% most deprived areas nationally, compared to um, 2015. So we highlight in the report some of the public health challenges that Warwickshire continues to face, hospital admissions, um, as a result of self-harm remains significantly higher. Our dementia diagnosis rate is still lower than the national average. Um, prevalence of depression in adults still higher than the national average. We have a higher proportion of adults classified as overweight or obese compared to the national average and hospital admissions for um, alcohol specific conditions remains higher. So we still have a lot of um, work to do in, 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 in because of COVID and, and the mood, we, we've tried not to include too many improvements this year to, to reflect the current mood across the country and across the county as well in relation to the, the impacts, the real negative impacts, significant impacts that people have experienced as a result of COVID. So this is where the report starts to get interesting. Um, it, it, it starts with a description of, of the timeline of events when COVID-19 first came to Warwickshire. And I remember 23rd of February when the first case was recorded. It was customary then for Public Health England. It was all very 007. Public Health England will ring the director of public health and tell them you have your first case or you have your second case. That is not the case anymore. Um, now we have over 28,000 cases that has been recorded till date in Warwickshire, and over 1,000 deaths, really green statistics. That chart that you see that's probably not that clear is um, captured within the report and it's just a fantastic picture representation of the timeline of, of events and key notable events that have happened across Warwickshire and across the country from um, the start of the pandemic and uh, captures some of what we've done till date to manage our response. We've established three place-based IMTs. Some of you are already probably already aware of that um, across the county, North, South, and Rugby. We have a community engagement um, work stream with partnership meetings. We have uh, a beacon response. We're part of um, one of eleven beacons that was set up to produce outbreak control plans. We have a seven-day week duty desk that's been running since, since September. Um, we have six community testing sites. And we've had hundreds of IMTs, um, outbreak and incident specific IMTs. We had 83 of this in, in January alone to manage uh, the most significant outbreak. So lots of work has been done across um, Warwickshire uh, County Council, within public health and other parts of the council to, to support the response to the pandemic. Chapters three and four of the annual reports 
Um, I personally find these chapters the, 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 the most um, significant in terms of how we've used people's stories and case studies to illustrate the impact on people who have tested positive for COVID-19 and the impact of lockdown. And during our planning meetings, when we decided that I was going to focus this year's annual report on health inequalities and COVID, I wanted a separation and a distinction to be made between the impact of having COVID as an infection and the impact of lockdown, because they are they both impact on people. They had impacts on people in quite different ways. And that is how uh, both chapters captured it. It also captures a lot of the positives that have emerged as a result of the pandemic, the sort of joint working and partnership with um, CARVA uh, to gather these this case studies. When we first started to talk about it, we thought we might not get that many case studies. The opposite happened. We're completely inundated and we've been unable to include every single case study that we received in, in the actual report. And that is why there's going to be an online gallery where some of this will be featured. Um, in, in terms of people who tested positive with COVID-19, again, we, we, we include case studies um, from a, a range of people, people who had mild disease, some people who had really severe disease and, and had to go into hospital and eventually ICU, some people who have suff suffered with long COVID. But as I've always previously mentioned, over 20,000 people have tested positive, over 1,000 people have died. Most people who test positive will recover. About 10 to 15 percent of cases will progress to severe disease, and one in three people who have COVID are asymptomatic. And this, probably for me, is, is the biggest issue because our community testing sites, which we set up, which has been a real testament to fantastic joint working across different parts of the council, is is it really designed to pick up people without symptoms of COVID-19, and they've done a fantastic job. Not captured in here. Well, nearly 114,000 tests, uh, over 1,000 positives have been picked up as a result of asymptomatic uh, testing for people without symptoms. Um, case studies show the importance of, of a range of support um, that we that have been put in place to help people recover. Um, whilst NICE has developed rapid guidelines for the management of COVID-19, the support that has been put in place in Warwickshire is captured within this report. So we've got long COVID support group, long COVID specialist clinics, access to fitter future service. Each of the case studies ends with recommendations uh, for improved um, services in the future or, or suggestions to do it differently in the future. So a, a lot of it is about what NICE recommends what we have done and what we might potentially do better in the future. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't label the points too much here. So as I said before, um, chapter four describes the impact of lockdown and what sort of impact it's had on people. Again, this is quite an interesting chapter because it captures both the negatives and the positives. So there, there, there are some positives that have emerged from lockdown. So the, the chapter uses a population health model approach. So if you think about our population health model, that talks about the interplay between four different interconnected factors, the wider determinants of health, our health behaviours, our lifestyle, the, uh, an integrated health and care system and the places and communities we live in. If you look at the box on the right hand, it's on my right hand side on, on the slide, the, the green ticks uh, are the positive impacts in, in terms of which um, aspect that we're looking at. So workplaces adopted settings and, and um, service delivery to ensure that they could be secure has been a positive aspect of lockdown. Flexible working has been something that everybody uh, has seen the positive impact in, in their lives. In terms of our health behaviours and lifestyles, most people have started to engage in much more physical activity. Uh, from my own point of view, because there's probably nothing else to do with your time, so you will go out and exercise. Uh, in terms of the places and communities we live in, there has been an increase in family connections as well. And I was reading this and I chuckled to myself, thinking that's probably because there's nothing to do but to talk to each other now that you're all stuck at home together. But there has been a, a real positive impact demonstrated um, from, from lockdown. But that doesn't uh, mean we should gloss over the negatives. There, there's been quite a number of negative impacts from lockdown as well. Uh, the impact on children that have had to stay at home long periods, impact on unemployment for people that have lost their jobs, there's been an increase in debt, uh, the impact on mental health and well-being, all of that is captured in, in this report as well. 
So I've talked about some of the positives. Something else that I probably need to highlight here has been the real community spirit that has emerged um, through the lockdown, especially through volunteering. Um, our community testing sites will not be a standing today without the support of our volunteers. There have been over nearly 300 volunteers currently supporting the community testing sites. And over 30 volunteers are volunteering as befrienders to people who are clinically extremely vulnerable. We need to also highlight the, the response from our public sector. It has been absolutely amazing. The six local authorities, our district and borough councils, coming into a local authority, a two-tier local authority for me, I had some um, nerves about working with districts and boroughs, having come from an unitary authority. And I must say that uh, the, the, the willingness and the partnership that has emerged as a result of COVID is nothing short of extraordinary. So the, 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 the positives are, are something that we actually absolutely need to, to celebrate. And then the way our businesses have just rallied around and adapted their practices, um, their COVID secure practices, every time there's a site visit, they're so willing and so engaging. I must say here that my, the experience from other directors of public health in other parts of the West Midlands has not been the same, especially in relation to business practices. Our businesses, the majority of them have been absolute troopers in terms of taking on our recommendations, working with our regulatory services and ensuring that they're doing the right thing. I talked about some of the challenges of lockdown. I probably won't labor it again, but we talked about the impact on physical health and well-being impact on mental health and well-being. The impact on mental health and well-being has been so pronounced that it is coming out, it's come out in, in a range of surveys, uh, COVID-19 impact surveys as a key priority for us. And it's a good thing that we have previously embedded this, included this as a priority in our health and well-being strategy going forward. I've also talked about the impact on lock of lockdown on the wider determinants of health as well. So in order to further explore the impact of lockdown, we also use case studies. So if you recall, we use case studies to demonstrate the impact of um, getting a diagnosis of COVID-19, having mild disease, severe disease, or long COVID. We've also used case studies to illustrate the impact of living through lockdown. And what we did was try and showcase um, people's experiences across five vulnerable groups. So we use case studies for people living with home, um, dealing with homelessness, loneliness and social isolation in older adults, young people with mental health needs, family poverty and adults with learning disabilities. And again, they just make for really a uh, touching read in my view and just brings on the point that um, lockdown has had a significant impact on a lot of people. And these are just examples. The, the list is not exhaustive. This slide just captures some of the uh, real examples and, and some of the impacts that people living with home homelessness, for example, loneliness, have experienced, and um, some of the actions that we took as a county council, working with our district and borough partners to tackle some of these issues. Uh, again, young people with mental health needs was featured, family poverty was featured, um, includes some of the statistics as well in terms of um, number of families on low income in Warwickshire. What is not captured in the slides and which, which is included in the report again is what we have done as a county council working with our partners to support people in these circumstances. Again, the same pattern for adults living with learning disabilities, real stories of, of joint collaborative efforts to support people. So the report um, includes five recommendations. Um, which uh, have made to reduce health inequalities in Warwickshire. When we first started to talk about um, health inequalities as a theme for the Director of Public Health Annual Report, it was literally a month into my post, so COVID was nowhere on the scene. I just knew that I wanted to do something on health inequalities. Uh, but then COVID came and added a different dimension to it. And we, I remember using the term as one of my DPH Annual Report project board meetings, that I would like something that shines a light on, on health inequalities. So COVID has more or less uh, magnify existing inequalities and has given us the opportunity to bring it to the forefront. So the first recommendation is about including health in all policies. This is one of my ambitions when I took on the role. How do we ensure that health is embedded in everything we do, in all strategies, um, no matter how tenuous the link, health can be embedded in everything that we do. Second recommendation about health inequalities and making sure that all health and wellbeing board partners commit to and deliver on an action plan to reduce health inequalities. 
third recommendation around community engagement, we've seen the impact of community engagement, how much we could do when we engage with our communities. Um, and that's why there's a recommendation on community engagement. It cannot be overemphasized. The fourth recommendation about the importance of prevention. In my experience in public health, we tend to pay lip service prevention. We all talk about it. The NHS throws it into everything they say. But when it comes to the actual embedding prevention into everything we do, we often seem to fall short. So there's a recommendation around making sure that we, we embed prevention into everything we do. We have opportunities going into the future with an emerging ICS to do the things differently and start to embed, embed prevention in commissioning decisions, uh, for example. And the final recommendation is around communication. Uh, the case studies have shown the value of connecting people with the right services to support them. So the needs to raise awareness, again, cannot be overemphasized. Uh, and uh, that's my final slide. The report is due to be published online on the week starting 22nd of March. There will be an online gallery to share further stories. I did talk about the fact that we received much more stories than we thought we were going to get, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, we would have a data dashboard that will follow the indicators over time. And um, feedback will, should be sent to Katie Wilson, who has been absolutely amazing in pulling all of this together, working with a bigger team. Uh, that's the end of, of uh, my presentation. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Can, can I really thank you for a for an absolute wonderful report done under very different conditions, and and re really say I don't think Warwickshire and and, and our region would be, would be where it is with it, with our excellent COVID position if it wasn't for you. So you've had a year uh, with us, almost a baptism fire, but you've you've excelled, and we are really grateful and thank you to you for what you produced and and you then produced. As an excellent report, uh, you keep talking about equalities. You've really given us uh, a ground a ground place to step off from and make a difference. So, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dave Parsons. Oh, thank you, Dave. Um, thank you, Charlotte. That was a, a really excellent presentation, and um, I, I'm hoping that we can actually have the slide circulated to all members. I know the full report is coming out. But I think that way through with the slides is a very good way of looking at the report and um, and it, it very worthwhile. Yeah, we'll um, that, Dave. Everything will come out. We'll send this out now it. as well, and then the final one when you when you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, that's great. Um, and can I absolutely commend your your focus on on health inequalities? Um, I suspect things are going to get worse before they get better. Um, but um, you know, we'll hope for the best. But um, you know, that's a really important focus. But I think it's the focus of, of of this area. Really, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Jeff Morgan. Yeah, thank Liz. Thank you, Liz. Um, Shade, that, that was very interesting. Um, I'm sure what you say about the public sector uh, is right. You know, there has been tremendous coming together and working together to, to resist the ravages of COVID. But don't let's forget the private sector. If it weren't for supermarkets, chemists, the corner shop, blokes, usually blokes, driving <laughs> vans and trucks, we wouldn't be where we are. Um, I mean, I, I think it's natural to, to focus on the public sector because that's where we are at the moment, but we do need to just step aside and think about the importance of people who've kept us fed and supplied. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. I, I noticed that those comments, uh, Councillor Morgan. Uh, so, Chris. Yes, uh, thanks very much, uh, Les, and uh, Shade, congratulations on your, your report. Um, it, two thoughts, and they may not be for this report, but one is, uh, are we able to quantify the impact on people's health, not directly or indeed indirectly, as you've been describing from COVID, but around other medical conditions? Because we know people with cancer, heart disease, etc., 
have often been delayed from receiving a diagnosis and a treatment, and that will be reflected in the health of our population. And being able to put some numbers on that, so it's sometimes quoted that for every person who very sadly has died with COVID, another person has died from another condition because of the knock-on effects of COVID. And the second comment is... um, Uh, I wonder if there's more to do in terms of drawing out the learning from COVID, because this will not be the last pandemic of the 21st century. And maybe if there's a silver lining, if that's not an inappropriate phrase to use, it is that we can get so much out of the experience of the last year or so that will mean we're better prepared next time round. And I think if there's any way of bringing out some of those uh, constructive lessons, that would be really helpful. Thank you. I think your second point is is a really valuable one, and I'm going to take that back to the uh, project board and see whether or not we we might be able to potentially incorporate that. The first point around quantifying the impact on people's health, again, you're right, that might not be something for the annual report, but it is um, reflected in the annual report. So, uh, it was impossible for me to cover everything that was in it, but there is a section that highlights and, and brings out the fact that a lot of um, people who, who would ordinarily have had elective procedures, for example, have had it cancelled, access to dentistry and uh, physiotherapy, all of that appears to have suffered as a result of, of the pandemic. So that is captured within the report. In terms of quantifying natural potentially possibly uh, years of life, life lost, for example, that is, is beyond the scope of this report, that's, but that's something I, I, I believe we need to think about. Okay, Chris. Yeah, um, I've got another hand. Uh, Jeff Morgan, hand still up. Are you? Apologies, Les. You're okay. Yeah. Are, are, the, are there any um, other, other comments from, from anyone? I've got no more hands up. So, In which case, um, we have two tasks. One is to note and support the draft uh, report as we've seen it today and the timetable to uh, make it public in in March. Um, And our second um, recommendation is to agree to endorse the recommendations which Shadi has so ably set out. And I think they're totally uh, appropriate in line with the report and, and the way we need to go. So... Are we all agreed that we do that, please? Anybody does not agree? No, Charlie, it's all yours to carry on. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you uh, for your report. It really was it was it was excellent. Thank you. If we could then move on to our second second report, which is a our new um, again in draft um, health and well being strategy. And ask Nigel to present it. And I think it Gemma as well. <laughs> yeah, th- thanks, Les. Um, I-, I think it's great. There's, there's some real synergy, I think, between um, Charlie's excellent report and um, and our new health and wellbeing strategy. Um, and she really highlights some of the issues that, that we hope the strategy will help to address. Um, Hopefully this will be very familiar to members of the board, although it will look slightly different, well actually looks very different, from the draft version they saw back in September. Um, And obviously it's also developed since the the update um, in January. So this is about really the the post-consultation version of the report um, and a little um, bit about the changes that have been made as a result of, of the consultation. So it's about um, getting to really the stage of um, final approval. Um, If we could move on, Gemma. Yeah, so consultation. Consultation took place over a period um, between um, the end of November, really, and the beginning of January. And obviously, that's quite a... It was quite an interesting period, I think it's fair to say, um, in terms of all kinds of other things that were going on. So I think the fact that we have um, well over 500 responses to the report, to the consultation, is a really positive message. Um, they were fairly evenly spread, the, the largest number from Warwick, then Stratford and North Warwickshire, generally good mix of ethnicity and disability. Um, and probably the only area where we could have done with slightly more responses or uh, was amongst younger age groups. 
Um, but I think in the context that we were um, operating at that time, I think I think you know it is a, a good um, a good reflection I think of Warwickshire in terms of, of the um, the feedback. And actually, that feedback was remarkably positive. You'll see that in terms of the ambitions, all of the um, percentage agreed are, are, are kind of high 80s, early 90s uh, in terms of percentages. People strongly support those um, ambitions. Um, and the majority of people supported as well our priorities over the next two years. And I think I, just, just a reminder, really, because it's a question that's come to me a couple of times, we did say that we would set out our priorities for the first couple of years of the strategy rather than for the full five year period, because I think it was important that we felt this wasn't a strategy that would sit on a shelf. That actually after that, during that two years, we would review, we would refocus, we would seek to deliver on those priorities and move on to whatever the new priorities were at the time. And I think there is something um, that, that COVID has added validity to that. I think we're probably less confident about what the world might look like and what we might be focusing on in five years' time than we would have been pre-COVID. So I think that that opportunity to kind of re refresh, revitalise the strategy as we go through um, its life, um, its lifespan is the phrase I'm looking for. Um, I think that will be really helpful. Um, as I said, strong support for those uh, priorities, particularly the priority about mental health and well-being. And of course, um, COVID has really um, shone a light, I think, as Charlie said, on on mental health issues. Um, so you've got a couple of uh, pieces of feedback here in terms of where we think um, I suppose where the consultation found that the strategy could be strengthened and so some action has been taken to to consider these. Uh, I should point out that you do have in the appendix, appendix one of the report, you do have the full consultation response analysis. Um, but those two key things really, better reflecting the partnership approach to delivery, I think that's really important. Uh, I think it's really important that we we strengthened the references to the voluntary community sector who are, you know, really key partners in terms of delivering the strategy. Um, and you'll see that particularly Ambition 2 has been rewritten to emphasise the role there. And then um, the need to work collaboratively with a wide range of diverse communities and that focus on, on a community based approach um, and again, in this case, Ambition 3 has been strengthened to reflect that. Um, yeah, so, so some feedback around, I suppose, the strategy. It, it's really difficult with strategies, isn't it? How much you focus on, on the big picture and how much you focus on the detailed kind of implementation and, and, and the monitoring and the measures and knowing how you've got there. So... Um, this has been strengthened within the strategy, but I think the key thing is that every health and wellbeing partnership across the, the, the three places in Warwickshire will develop an implementation plan, and that links really closely to the work around place planning that's already ongoing. And actually, one of the things we've agreed to do is to pull together the place leads to share that kind of uh, their delivery intentions and how we use those places to deliver the overall strategy. Of course, there will be some things that are delivered on a county-wide basis too that will sit alongside that place-based delivery. The plan on a page. Always good to be able to see this. And I think this is a really helpful reminder, really, of, of where we started in this development work. Most people on this call would have been at the various um, workshops we held um, facilitated by the King's Fund to develop that integrated, what I refer to as, as the King Fund, King's Fund model. I'm sure others have different names for it, but around our population health framework. And that real emphasis across those all four quadrants. And of course, for us as a health and wellbeing board, the really key bits are the intersections between them and where those different pieces meet. So, um, 
what next? First of all, we need feedback. So it's really important that we, we, we provide feedback to respondents. Um, something that, that um, some of us were involved in a conversation about yesterday, about how we make sure people understand that their voices have been heard and how we have made changes um, in response to their opinions uh, and their, their contributions. Um, so, so particularly the you said we did kind of section on, on the website will be a, a key part of that. And then the next stage is back to our health and well-being uh, executive and to those place partnerships to develop a detailed um, delivery plan, which I am sure the health and well-being board will want to monitor over time um, as, as we implement that and seek to develop and achieve our aims. And of course, the way that the thing that will help them to do that is the outcomes framework that we'll be developing. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say um, in terms of the strategy overall. Um, I did want to say that, you know, although I have the, the kind of the privilege of presenting this, it, it represents the work of a, of a, of a you know, significant number of people who have contributed to bringing it forward. Uh, and I particularly wanted to thank Gemma um, for her work in kind of coordinating all that and bringing it all together, because I think we have a, a strategy that meets the needs of Warwickshire at this time. I think we can evidence where it's come from and why people should feel that um, or why we think people will feel that it meets those needs uh, and a strategy that, it, that is clear and coherent and, and readable. Um, happy to take any questions or comments, Chair. Thank, thank you, Nigel. Um, an, ex an excellent report in my view. I think it is a step change for us and, and it's very positive as to where we want to uh, lead and, and move forward to. Uh, and can I just say that uh, it has been presented to um, the leaders of all our boroughs and districts, and they they have endorsed it as as a as a good partnership document uh, as we move forward. Um, Stella, did you want to? Um, yes, yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nigel, for the the presentation. Um, mine is a comment um, almost to all of us around this um, virtual table, but in particular linking to Sir Chris Ham, in that key for me is how we make both the Warwickshire health and wellbeing strategy and the Coventry health and wellbeing strategy link in to our ICS slash health and care partnership work. I think as everyone knows, I think we all have our moments of um, tearing our hair out about the complexity of structures and, you know, overlapping circles between um, our, our various relationships, partnerships and organisations. And I think one of the key things to make sure that the outcomes that you want in Warwickshire are effective, but that the outcomes that we all want um, across the system overall is being able to trace the lines between whatever actions we agree, either as individual institutions, so the county council, UHCW, whoever, um, or collectively so that we can trace what impact we think those actions are going to have which of those actions are going to impact first and which, as a lot of them obviously will be much longer term, how we're going to see those feed through the system. So I think there's quite an interesting job of, I don't know whether it's macrame or whether it's knitting, but some combination, some combination of that, which means something drops out at the end of all of this, which we can clearly explain to the public what the outcome of our collective action is supposed to achieve and in what time scales we're, we're going to achieve it. Thank you. Nigel, did you want to respond? No, I, I, I need to say that I agree with all that. I think, I think it is really important. Um, I think the, the, the model, so, so we, sp we spoke for quite a long time about how we develop an implementation plan for the strategy. And I think the the end point that we got to, which is that actually the strategy should effectively be, sorry, the implementation plan should effectively be a combination of the three implementation plans at place, which are already multi-agency plans, with anything that we need to pick up at a county-wide level um, to make sure, along sitting alongside that, uh, to make sure that actually we are as embedded and we're trying to do things once and have one set of priorities. And I think that, that we can get there. 
Um, in terms of Coventry, it becomes slightly more complex. Um, I, I suppose the, the benefit we have is that we have two health and wellbeing strategies that have been developed against the same set of principles. So both based on the King's Fund model, both with a focus on wider determinants and, and on health inequalities. And, and I think there are definitely opportunities for us to align an enormous amount of the work, although remaining you know the fact that we are slightly different kind of places and that there will need to be a little bit of variation but actually probably no more variation than there is between the south place and the rugby place or the rugby place and the, uh, and the north okay, so, okay thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you um no i i i still think this is going to be uh, i think that's very helpful but i think it's going to be um let's put it this way an interesting area I think it's probably be a whole full meeting for the uh, for the joint meeting as we had this week. It could be a, an all all day one. Um, I'll leave it as a legacy. Um, Sarah Raystreet. Oh, thanks. You, you sort of picked up on my point really um, at, at the end there, Nigel. So thanks, thanks for this. You, I can see you're really trying to make clear something that is is complex as Stella's described. So I think for something that's a really public facing documents um, I think this is you know this is really really good whilst not underplaying the complexities that will be as a as a strategy document I think we, we produce we I take no credit for it you and your team have, have produced something and um, something really um, really good I think my, my comment was going to be about the um, ensuring freedom at place um, in our in our system for Rugby, Warwickshire North and South Warwickshire um, within that overarching framework will be an interesting sort of positioning, I guess, when we bring in Coventry, who have a, a different um, a different overall strategy. And so potentially, whilst all under the umbrella of our of our place forum and our objectives, may feel that they've got slightly more uh, place-based direction so I think um but you you touched on that at the end and I can the clear thought has gone into how the different places within Warwickshire can implement perhaps differently the strategy but still stick to the strategic principles so what working out to do and, and that sort of Free, allowance of freedom to reach the right objectives but yeah I just I just wanted to say as a as a public facing document and something for us all to look at and and start to to really understand I think this is this has gone a lot further than than we've gone before so so thank you it's really positive thanks sir. just just on your point about our three Warwickshire places I did have a meeting with the three um chairs and, and um, sort of effective officers of them, um, what, 10 days ago now, um, to talk through this report and how it sits within their thinking. And so that is something that I'll leave behind is where they are going to meet regularly, uh, which will pick up some of the issues you say about how they do what they need to do. But uh, keep in mind this, and I suppose for the future, um, not for me, is that um, Coventry can be invited probably at that point so they could have an informal chat because it's not a minute meeting, it's just to get together and talk about where we go. Mm -hmm. Maybe want to think about. Uh, yeah. Nice, just so, yeah, can I just, just add, cause I, I, it's really helpful feedback. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I think one of the things that I, I wanted to pick up as well, I think absolutely there has to be a freedom of place to implement in a way that delivers the outcomes that works for that particular place. I think that that's one part of the complex equation. I think the other part of the complex equation is, is that place will want to do lots of things that are not in the strategy. And I think we need to be conscious of that and we need to let them get on with that. Um, and actually not try to pull everything under the, the umbrella. So we have a clear set of ambitions here. We have a clear set of priorities. I think we need to pick up from the place plans the stuff that is relevant to those priorities, and we need to leave the other things for place to get on with, I suppose, outside yeah. of this and not try to um, not try to do everything. Um, but, um, yeah, 
other than that, um, I, I think the comments really helpful. And I think it is, you know, I think I would reiterate that it is a, a genuine kind of partnership effort uh, to put it all together. Thank you, Nigel. Any other comment? I've got no, um, nobody else on my screen. No. So we have um, four recommendations. One is to note the outcomes from the public consultation, which you've got in Appendix 1 and Nigel has explained. Um, to approve the final uh, strategy that we've got before us today and the three priority areas which we, we have been through uh, and support that we do give give it an annual review to make certain it is still pertinent uh, and up to date but not uh, totally redo it every time like we have at the moment uh, and support as we've just been discussing development of the local place based implementation plans through through the three local places um, which um, we basically discussed are we all in agreement that, that is the way forward yeah I can see nobody saying no so uh, that is what we will do and move forward and thank you Nigel and let's record our thanks to everybody that's taken part to get this um, strategy to uh, to where it is it's very good thank you so uh, we will then move on to another uh, vital uh, strategy, which is our homeless strategy in, in conjunction with our, our borough and districts. Uh, and welcome Emily Fernandez to uh, introduce this item. And uh, good afternoon, Lisa, as well. Good, good afternoon, Les. Good afternoon, Les. Um, just before before uh, uh, talking about this this really important. Um, strategy I'd like to lend my voice to the, the others as well and to say thank you for all of the help and support that you've given to us um, and, uh, uh, in, in taking forward our work on homelessness. Again you've been a champion for that, you've got behind us, you've helped to shape uh, our views, you've helped us get it, get this to where it is today so I know I'll speak on behalf of all of the, the heads of housing um, from all the districts and boroughs and, and, and firmly as well when I say from the bottom of my heart a big thank you and we wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, that's very, very um, kind. This, um, this paper actually comes at a, at a really interesting time for us all um, with many of the the real problems that COVID has brought to us being really at focus for this community. And we've called the the our strategy document, Preventing Homelessness. And homelessness means so many different things to, to many of us. And if I just draw you just for a second to think about what home means to you, what many of you are actually sitting in your homes right now. And I know when I speak to people, home is not about bricks and mortar. Home is about the family that's, that's inside with us. It's a place where we can be ourselves. It's a place where we can relax when we're walking down the street, we don't see a row of homes, we see a row of houses. And homelessness encompasses a lot of, of, of different, um, different situations. It covers people fleeing domestic abuse. It covers people who are coming to the end of their private sector tenancy. It covers young people who can no longer stay in the family home. And of course, it's most literal meaning. It's... Um, it's people who are living out underneath the stars, those who are rough sleepers. And this strategy comes at a really uh, important time uh, for us. This weekend uh, in Warwick, we lost three of our former rough sleepers. Two of those died as a result of drug abuse uh, and one uh, because of alcohol abuse. This is because county lines have increased the amount that they were putting into, into their packets that they were selling for £10. And our former rough sleepers took the whole lot and sadly lost their lives as a result of that. But what's really key is that two of those individuals had got their own home. They'd been through the temporary arrangements we put in place for COVID and, uh, uh, and were now part of the house community. The other was living in a settled um relationship with his girlfriend and couldn't be described any longer as being street homeless. So homelessness in this context is not a, just a housing issue. It's a problem that belongs to all of us and we all have to work together to try and uh, solve it. And that's what makes this um, strategy 
and this partnership approach so important. Thanks, Emily. So for some time now, all of the agencies uh, you can see along the bottom of the slides have been working uh, to, to try and think about what we need to do to, to try and address some of those issues that I've, I've just mentioned. And back in um, the back end of 2018, uh, let's all remember coming to a conference that we held uh, in, in the outskirts of, of rugby that brought together um, people from statutory services, from the voluntary sector, from the volunteer community to look at um, different aspects of homelessness. And we, we held a, a number of different workshops uh, that are listed there, looking at substance misuse, young people and care leavers, uh, health and homelessness, rough sleeping, domestic abuse. And we had some uh, great keynote speakers Dr. Nigel Hewitt from The Pathway and Victoria Kell came along from government to speak to us and to share their ideas and thoughts. And those delegates uh, in, got together in workshops and formed their ideas about what we should all be doing as statutory agencies to help them and for us to help ourselves to try and uh, combat homelessness. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> um, and so that was probably the first time that this board uh, took a paper from um, uh, from the districts and boroughs and, and, and Emily, and that sought approval from you to form a homeless strategic group reporting directly into this board, and for that to start to work to develop a county-wide strategy on tackling and reducing homelessness. And we also began to look into the feasibility of developing the pathway model in Warwickshire, which was to combat the uh, inappropriate discharges back out into uh, into homelessness really and to stop the the, the, the cycle that we see of homeless people um, ending up in hospital when other other processes would have been um, and options would have been better for them. Thank you Emily. So we've got a wide range of partners involved alongside the county council, all the districts and borough councils, We've got a number of other agencies, such as the Police and Crime Commissioner, the, the Warwickshire and West Mercia um, Probation Service, and, and the Phil Projects, together with uh, the, net, the NHS and Warwickshire Cares. And, and those groups have, have started to, to um, look at the different strands uh, by breaking into smaller task and finish groups. So those groups have, have really sort of started to unpick what those issues are across Warwickshire, particularly, and started to engage then with the voluntary sector and our, our colleagues in health. Um, although, although it's been fairly limited and we've had to develop new and virtual ways of trying to do that because of COVID, we've had some really useful and vibrant discussions and some great ideas have emerged about the sorts of things that we, we could be doing, both big things and little things, to try and make things a bit better. And each of the, um, the chapter leads has started to uh, raise the issues at other re related boards and, and other meetings, such as myself, I've taken a lot of the issues to the Warwickshire Reoffending, Reducing Reoffending Board, for example, and um, the MAPA Strategic Management Board. We've then taken uh, some thoughts and, and the draft strategy around to some county-wide engagements and we've used citizen space to do that for us. And you can see some of the responses that we, we've got. But there's, I think we can say, overwhelming uh, agreement with people either agreeing wholly or to some extent about the sorts of priorities that we identified um, uh, for each of the, the different sort of themes that were beginning to come out. And the, the, um, some of the changes that we made were around thinking about education, for example, uh, with offenders trying to... Um, make sure that there was some form of education so that they could understand, offenders could understand what opportunities exist prior to release, helping to prepare people leaving prison with new and different life skills that would help them reacclimatise and integrate back into society and try and find employment. Um, and although veterans were mentioned, we tried to make better linkages uh, thanks to the, the feedback that we received. Uh, particularly mentioning the, 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 the mental health challenges that very often accompany the uh, um, 
the issue for, for veterans. And drawing reference, of course, to the military uh, community covenant, which requires housing authorities uh, to prioritise uh, veterans. And although it's a housing allocations and policy matter for, for the districts and boroughs, and work is happening on the on uh, elsewhere on this, it's nevertheless it was important to reference within the within the strategy. And although we really wanted to. Uh, to embed service user involvement, we were unable to do that in a COVID secure way, um, certainly during wave one and two lockdowns. And therefore, what we've done is made a commitment to involving the service users in parts of the action plan, um, obviously where appropriate, and to try and establish a service user um, involvement mechanism uh, to enable them to give us their feedback uh, and, and get their really unique and, and inter integral perspective into the delivery of the strategy recommendations. Thanks Emily. So the preventing homelessness strategy is split into five different themes and these emerged and can be referenced right back to the conference that we had back in 2018 and they are health, that was, that was one of the biggest uh, drivers for us, financial inclusion, young people, uh, a major issue uh, for, all, for all of us really, domestic abuse, and offending. And those recommendations and actions are being aligned as we speak to, to existing partnerships to help us to strengthen the, the delivery. And I was really pleased to see that the Warwickshire Reducing Reoffending Board asked to see the uh, homelessness strategy and they were they were really uh, wanting to take any of the recommendations to feed it into the Reducing Reoffending Action Plan. So that was really, really good to see that that was happening. And you can see there that the, the Safe Accommodation Working Group for Domestic Abuse will be looking at their recommendations, the Financial Inclusion Partnership, and of course the Health and, and, and Wellbeing Board here. You, you'll obviously be really interested to see those sort of health um, um, recommendations that come out. Um, and I don't know whether John Coleman's here today, but obviously he and his team have got a really interest in the young people um, aspects of all of this and we'll continue to have dialogue with him and the team to make sure that, that they're progressed. Thanks Emily. Um, and then no strategy would really be complete without a vision and some principles. So what, what we're really trying to, to achieve um, and how would, we, how would we do that? So again, we've tried to work collaboratively on all of the, the, the thematic chapters, developing a series of recommendations with input from so many organisations who've helped to shape the direction of the strategy. And I think we're all really grateful to our, uh, our partners in other statutory agencies, but also the, the, the fantastic voluntary and community sector that we've got here across Warwickshire, without which we couldn't have, have really delivered all, this, <coughs> all the services that we needed to do um, um, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and so we, we've come together with, to form these five um, strategic visions about trying to reduce some of those inequalities and improving the health of people at risk of homelessness um, and those who are actually homeless or sleeping rough in Warwickshire to enhance and improve our services that prevent homelessness among young people who surely not becoming homeless in the first place is far um, the better option. To prevent domestic abuse and the crisis homelessness resulting from it wherever we, we can, although we recognise that that's not possible. To deliver better focused housing and related support services for those at risk of homelessness and those who are leaving prison and to ensure that a wide range of appropriate services are available to support those at risk of homelessness due to financial difficulties. And now, if we just turn to think about just one of those uh, strategic chapters for, for a moment, and so the one that's closest to the Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, and, and Emily will come and talk to you about the, the health component. Over to you, Emily. Great, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so um, I guess, for the purpose of this presentation, as Lisa said, it would, it's important to kind of take everyone through a bit of a run through of the evidence that sits behind this, particularly in relation to um, the impact of homelessness on health. So many of you will be will probably be familiar with some of this, but um, it's important to set the context around how the evidence 
that we've looked at informs the strategy. And the approach um, that I'm going to talk about today has been the same approach that we've taken with all of the chapters within the strategy. So all um, chapters had a, um, a lead, um, which comprised of all of the heads of housing plus myself for the health chapter. And what we did was we, we reviewed all kind of published um, papers and journals and publications to really look up nationally um, and regionally and locally, what does the evidence tell us in terms of the impact of homelessness on the um, subject um, matter focused on in each of the chapters. So in terms of health, um, we you can see here that the causes of um, homelessness in relation that have the biggest impact on health include things like poverty, um, adverse childhood experiences, mental health and substance misuse, having a personal history of violence, um, an involvement in the criminal justice system and alcohol misuse with a strong association with initiation and persistence of homelessness. Now, these causes are not exclusive to health, but obviously go on to have quite a significant impact on individuals' health. So in terms of young people, the risk factors that we've identified also include um, things like family conflict, victimisation, non-heterosexual identity and experience of being in the child welfare system. And for these risk factors for young people, you can see that all of these would actually also constitute an adverse childhood experience. So what is important to highlight within the evidence um, and probably a caveat to some of this information is when looking at the evidence in terms of health and homelessness, there was often little differentiation between being homeless, temporarily housed and rough sleeping. So sometimes that was made very clear in the evidence, other times they were um, kind of referred to in a generic way. Um, but what was very clear in the evidence actually was um, people experiencing rough sleeping and what this actually does and impacts on their average age of death. So for males, it's 44 years and for females, 42 years compared to age 76 and 81 respectively in the general population, which, as you can see, is significantly um, lower. So causes of excess mortality for our homeless population in, include things such as HIV and TB infections, heart disease, substance misuse, and then also external factors around unintentional injuries, which can include suicide and poisoning. Um, and this can often be from medication or illicit, illicit substances. Um, and then in terms of um, the homeless population, generally they have a higher exposure, exposure to risk factors compared to the um, general population. And those are our usual suspects in terms of alcohol, smoking, drugs and mental health problems. But they're of, often significantly worse for the homeless population. OK, so the homeless population's physical health, mental health, Prevalence of infectious diseases and age-related impairments are all worse compared to the general population. And there is also evidence to, to suggest that their poor health status is exacerbated by their poor access to health services. One interesting example um, that we looked at from a systematic review looked at the prevalence of mental disorders among the homeless population in Western countries. And that showed that the most common mental disorders were classed as alcohol and drug dependence and that the prevalence estimates for psychosis was as high as depression. Now, this is a marked contrast to the prevalence estimates for psychosis in the general population, where psychosis is always generally lower than depression. OK, um, so we know that homeless populations are higher users of acute services, which include a and &E and inpatient admissions. And as Lisa mentioned, one of the recommendations that we brought to the Health and Wellbeing Board um, was around conducting pathway needs assessments across our acute trusts. 
So, so far in Warwickshire, we've completed these for UHCW and SWIFT, and we'll be doing the same pieces of work, um, repeating that work within CWPT and George Elliott Hospital this year. Now, evidence from our needs assessments from URHCW and SWIFT so far actually mirror the published evidence around um, our homeless populations being higher users of acute services. And this naturally has a knock-on effect on cost, which is estimated from national evidence to be four times higher compared to the general population and actually eight times higher for inpatient services. So some of the published evidence and local evidence does also indicate that on occasion, and this is less frequently, um, but on occasion, sometimes people are discharged onto the streets without their underlying health conditions being necessarily met. Now that in itself is quite a broad statement because some of the really complex homeless people um, who end up being kind of admitted into hospital um, it would almost be impossible to discharge them having sorted out all of their complex issues. But there's much more work to be done collaboratively across the health system to support these individuals. So um, the recommendations from the pathway needs assessment, along with other health specific interventions, such as Warwickshire's homeless nursing service teams, will all seek to begin to address some of these challenges. Now I'm just going to take you through the specific health recommendations. So these recommendations have been developed um, as, as um, the rest of the recommendations in the strategy, but in partnership with um, lots of health partners who have really, um, you know, understood some of the challenges and been really open to discussing some of the challenges, issues that this population faces. So I'll just take you through these really quickly. So the first recommendation is around supporting the mobilisation of the mental health enhanced care pathway in Warwickshire. Now, this is our mental health nursing service in Warwickshire for the homeless population. And it's actually been in operation for about 18 months. And we have an arrangement whereby two mental health nurses are seconded from CWPT into Warwickshire's P3 Street Outreach Service. Um, and that's been an invaluable service during the um, last 12 months in the kind of under the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic. So going forward, CWPT are actually going to subsume these roles back in-house within their community transformation programme. And the partnership will continue to work closely with the trust and the community and voluntary sector to further develop this service and learn lessons from the first 18 months of delivery. So secondly, um, there's a recommendation around holding collaboratively, co collaborative discussions with the trust, CWPT, around options for prioritise, prioritising mental health support for people who are homeless and rough sleeping. So I guess this is similar to the Veterans Pathway in CWPT. Um, we've agreed to work in partnership with the trust to explore options around whether prioritising mental health services for this population is a realistic option and establishing the ways in which these individuals can be supported during a crisis. Thirdly, supporting the development and embedding of the dual diagnosis protocol and pathways into mental health and drug and alcohol services. So whilst the dual diagnosis pathway and protocol is established, when working and drawing this strategy together, um, one of the things that was highlighted was there was perhaps a lack of awareness for support organisations around this protocol. So we thought it would be really good to have a focus on this to understand where there are gaps in um, perhaps knowledge and information and how we can work collaboratively in order to gain maximum appropriate support for this homeless population when we're trying to support them through their drug and alcohol journeys. Fourthly, um, we want to consider system-wide options to address the physical health needs of people who are homeless and rough sleeping. As you've already heard throughout the other two presentations this afternoon, um, you know, COVID has really exacerbated some of these inequalities. However, with our um, homeless population, um, I think COVID probably has benefited partners in some ways. And what I mean by that is it's 
um, really shone a light on some of those um, really complex individuals who prior to COVID perhaps were not on our radar quite as much or were not engaging with statutory and community and voluntary sector organisations quite as much. So COVID actually has improved what we know about the physical health of this population and our access to this population has been increased due to the government's everyone in directive. However, I think as we emerge from the pandemic, we need to be able to, I guess, harness that knowledge and those positive relationships that we've all established and continue to work together to address the population's health needs. We have our wonderful physical health outreach nurses that are provided by SWIFT and they have been invaluable during the past 12 months of the pandemic. Um, however, there, there are wider um, challenges around supporting the population to access primary care appropriately and um, we need to work on that going forward and also their appropriate access to primary care in turn should impact on the volume of acute care emergency admissions. So fifthly, um, we want to ensure access to pharmacies. And this would largely be through exploring the use of behaviour policies. So our research in drawing this strategy together has highlighted that sometimes people's behaviour can lead them to being banned from local pharmacies. And we want to work with partners to ensure access to pharmacies or no access to pharmacies if they do um, get asked not to attend, that that doesn't become a barrier to people's drug and alcohol recovery. And, and one of the tools that we'd like to explore is the use of behaviour policies. Sixthly, there's something around maintaining good dental health. It's really important for us to fully understand the pathways to ensure that people who are homeless can access dental treatment in a timely manner and avoid emergency treatment. Because this population doesn't access health services traditionally, often um, when uh, people are struggling, particularly with um, dental challenges, we get notified of this quite late and therefore, much like um, access to secondary care, the treatment then becomes really costly and this can be avoided understanding those pathways in more detail and sharing that information across partnerships. Seventhly, um, there's something about facilitating entry into residential rehabilitation and inpatient detoxification services. And by this, we mean exploring opportunities for people who are homeless or sleeping rough to access both commissioned and privately funded detox and rehab services and ensuring a quality assured approach to both. One of the things that the COVID pandemic has highlighted in supporting our most complex individuals if they require um, a detox service or a rehab service. Um, there have been opportunities during the past 12 months whereby organisations or even their family members have sought to pay for a private service. And what we found through our Warwickshire County Council commissioned um, detox and rehab services is um, not all of these providers are on our framework contract. So if a family member or a community voluntary sector organisation gets the funds together, we want to be able to support them to make the right choice of rehab or detox services through ensuring a quality assured approach. And our final health recommendation is around improving the accessibility of services available for homeless individuals who may have a learning disability or autism. Now, this can be achieved by increasing awareness of autism and learning disability issues amongst our practitioners, providing accessible and easy read documentation, ensuring reasonable adjustments to services are made by improving links with relevant health and social care practitioners, and increasing access to advocacy services to ensure individuals are not inappropriately excluded from accessing suitable housing. I'm just going to hand you back over to Lisa for the last slide. Lisa? Lisa, you're on your own. Yeah, that's been the same of this year, hasn't it? Um, yes, like, like any strategy, there are challenges in, in, in delivering this house. And um, we'll just put some of them down here. 
resources um, in terms of, of staff when we're all really busy running about trying to deal with COVID and, and other um, service priorities. Money and budget is a massive um, challenge for us, both in, in terms of trying to align budgets to support the objectives of the strategy, but also in trying to maintain the levels of, of funding that go, uh, that, that, that go into um, services that are, are allied to delivery of the, of the strategy. Um, so around the, I mean, we all have heard about the, the cuts to the uh, proposed cuts to the health and um, housing related support um, budgets, and that is going to inevitably introduce some real challenges uh, for us going forward, particularly in trying to, to maintain the support um, that so many of our vulnerable people desperately require. Covid brought some real challenges. Um, and we've, we've, we've heard from Sh uh, Shade earlier about what some of those were and what the picture of that looked like. And we were at the sharp end in terms of dealing with people out on the streets. And through the Everyone In initiative, we've, done, we've turned tricks and been able to do some absolutely fantastic things. And we've seen some people who are long-term entrenched rough sleepers being able to be brought in um, and, and uh, are now in settled accommodation. Certainly one of them locally, uh, when the, the, the shops opened up was, was found just coming out of um, a second-hand shop and when the member of staff inquired as to, to why he was there he'd been buying some little trinkets through his window ledge which is absolutely fantastic but it's also meant that we've had to deal with, with a lot of fallout as well through Covid by trying to accommodate some people who really aren't ready for accommodation um, and that's manifested itself in, in um, increased county lines, murders, stabbings, all sorts of, of things that, again, that have really tested us as partners uh, and tried our partnerships. Um, but that's one of the things that has stayed strong and, in fact, has grown stronger as a result of COVID and, and those partnerships. We've got there's, um, a ton of different pressures, a ton of different priorities on both the, on staff teams on services, uh, on budgets, uh, and money and funding, and I think that that's going to be um, really difficult for us to try and garner all of these in into the right direction to try and support our homelessness strategy um, going forward into the future. And our partnerships have been at times challenging uh, as, as those agencies have, have had other priorities to deal with and, and other pressures placed upon them. Uh, locally and, and by government as well and at times it's, it has been trying a bit like trying to herd cats um, and trying to keep everybody uh, on the end of the, uh, the bait to keep them interested in, in this in this issue because sure, sure as eggs are eggs once we're uh, once we're over this those agencies will be back at, at our door saying what are you going to do about about our homeless people um, so so it's important that we try and uh, embed those partnerships and that's why it's so important for the health and wellbeing board to have got hold of this agenda and really to act as our fulcrum um, around which we, we try and can, can try and broker some uh, some strength around that so it's not going to be easy um, um, but but I know that together we can we can try and do this and, and try and maintain that sort of strength so what we're going to do next? Well, we've reinstated again. I don't know whether reinstated is the, is the right word because it never really went away. But we've re-energised it. We've re-energised that, that homelessness strategic group now to focus on the strategy action plan and to really drill down on what is it that we can do that will make that difference and make it better for us all and, more importantly, for, for homeless people um, going forward. We've um, nominated both a housing and a non-housing lead to each chapter, and that's really to try and tie those partners in uh, and to get them to get some, some grip and some buy into those, um, to those recommendations and to, to enable us to, to deliver on those, because one person on their own can't, uh, very often can't do that. We're looking at developing some smaller working groups so that we can, we can keep that expertise going, we can keep that dialogue going, we can keep that interest um, in, the, in those work areas. Um, and more, more uh, appropriately is that we get the support for those recommendations and those action points uh, so that we get them delivered and taken forward. And as we've, uh, we've mentioned before, we, we're aligning those. We're trying to, did somebody say macrame earlier on? I thought that was really good. We are trying to macrame or knit or crochet 
um, our recommendations and priorities right and get those embedded into into other strategic groups and action plans and forums again to just strengthen that that partnership de delivery we've we've really formed a, a, a really clear opinion that no one agency can solve homelessness and we've done, we've got to work together and we've got to, and, and our strength that, that problem solved is a problem halved in, in in trying to tackle these issues so that strategic group will look now at the recommendations and how those actions should be prioritized we've got a whole shopping list of things that we need to do but some will will get will, will have a uh, better impact than, than others and we need to just hone down which those are uh, based on their effectiveness to try and reduce um, homelessness and available uh, in within the available resources so i think that that kind of concludes our, our presentation les um and we're delighted really to be able to to come to you we, we didn't think we would with covid we thought well that's it it's on the back shelf but we've uh, we've continued we've pressed on and i'm really pleased that we were able to deliver it at your last meeting uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank, thank you, Emily. And, and I uh, apologise, Lisa. I should have introduced you at the at the beginning. Lisa, Lisa is the head of housing at Warwickshire and a real uh, a real um, proponent of our strategy and, and keeping it alive and moving uh, alongside Emily. So thank you both very much for uh, a great presentation. Uh, and yes, housing nation report is a, uh, a service, but it is um, on hold as we are. Uh, but we all need to get together and, and look at what we really do with that and how we make that a more effective service. So there's another one on the list um, for, for you as, as, as you move, move, move forward. Um, Judy. I think Lisa is surprised that I'm probably first on the, on the uh, comments on this. Um, I, I'm really, really pleased with this. Um, I think so many elected members will say that one of the biggest parts of our, our uh, caseload is, is homelessness in all its shapes and forms uh, and how it impacts on, on the whole of, of, of your authority. Um, so I really welcome it and I know, again, you won't be surprised to know that I particularly welcome Chapter 6, which is on um, domestic abuse, because yeah. uh, I've always had many meetings about my concerns with it. Uh, and really, it's just a question and it's a bit Linked to what Sarah said about Coventry and Warwickshire, um, I know we we have um, residents of, of Warwickshire who go into refuges in Coventry, and I presume we do a, a similar backwards and forwards. So, how uh, um, is this strategy going to work with our residents who actually are placed in refuges out of? Um, um, out of county, you know, I presume half Coventry got a similar uh, strategy. Um, I'm saying Coventry because that's what I know. I don't know if it occurs in, in South Warwickshire where they go to other refuges in other areas. Obviously, we, wherever possible, we try to, to offer refuge place in, in, um, in Warwickshire. So I'm just interested how we work with uh, Coventry with this, as there's a Coventry and Warwickshire Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, and I'm also a little bit concerned about, you know, the government's um, uh, domestic abuse bill, which saying concern may sound strange because it strengthens things, but um, I know if we have a duty of care to, to a domestic uh, abuse victim, I think from any area who, who may need to come to us. And I'm, I'm worried about the, uh, um, there's only so many houses, uh, so many places, you know, uh, in a, an area whichever borough it is. So while I welcome it, I also have great concerns as a, a district um, councillor on, on how we can possibly accommodate everybody. Um, but yeah, it's cross, it's cross sport of work, work and I'm, I'm really thinking about. Thank you, Mrs. Do you want me to say? Yeah, you, you kick off then, then Lisa might um, I mean, I, I think Nick had some, so Nick um, might want to kind of come in on this as well. But obviously with the domestic abuse um, bill, um, there's a proposal to set up a safe accommodation working group, um, which the Commissioner for Domestic Abuse Services, Emma Guest, is leading on. 
Um, and obviously that will um, involve looking at some of those things you've mentioned, Councillor Falp, um, in particular those cross-border issues. So it's it's it feels like the stars have aligned. It's a really good opportunity to really kind of um, have a focus, think about some of those domestic abuse and homeless related challenges and the domestic abuse bill gives us a real opportunity to do that across partnerships and across um, organisational boundaries as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, can are you on the call? Did you, did you want to comment? Uh, certainly suggest. I don't know whether he's, he's quite made it, made it on um, okay. thank you, Councillor Lisa. Cable, but, but, but I think, you know, the, the, the issue is that, you know, I'm going to use the term women because nine times out of ten it, it, it is women. And sometimes it really is appropriate for uh, for a woman to be, lo to be accommodated, even if it's temporarily, as to the district, uh, particularly if there are stalking um, issues. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll try wherever possible. I'd place it in a refuge in, uh, within in the district. Not every woman wants or needs to go to a refuge. You know, many will just um, accept a, a, and be perfectly okay in in in, in different forms of co temporary accommodation that the districts and, and boroughs have. But making sure that they get the access to the right support and help is is crucial. In that, absolutely crucial. And yes, you're right that. That women fleeing uh, domestic abuse or people fleeing domestic abuse can approach any any council that's that's changing legislation. Uh, they can go anywhere they need to, and again, that's um, that's as a result of of, of of seeing too many domestic homicides um, and government taking the the the, the view really that uh, that women should be able to, to go where wherever it is that they feel safe uh, to do so. We don't encounter. You know, huge numbers of out of areas, um, and my understanding from talking to the co colleagues elsewhere is that uh, very often seaside towns are those who suffer uh, the worst from that, with with people wanting to gravitate back to to places where they had happy childhood holidays, um, and, and that gives them a, a different feeling of, of, of safety. But um, it's certainly something that we're alive to in Warwickshire. I know that we have uh, taken women uh, uh, fleeing um, abuse. Um, and accommodated them in, in the locality. And sometimes those women have, have then returned to their place of origin, um, and sometimes they've settled uh, uh, within, our, within our districts. Um, so we'll help them to do that wherever wherever we need to. Thank, uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I've got John Bowman, then Becky Hale. John. Uh, can you put me further down the list, Chairman? I'm, I've just been had a call that I've got to go and deal with. Thank you. That's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll take Becky next. Well, that's probably helpful because mine links to the last discussion about <laughs> domestic abuse. Um, just wanted to um, share um, where we are around the recommissioning of domestic abuse um, services. So um, as Emily indicated, um, we are recommissioning and, and working on the recommissioning of our domestic abuse support services, including accommodation based support. Um, we've also been allocated, as has um, every other um, local authority in the country, additional money to support um, the, the implementation of the Domestic Abuse Bill. Um, so I think it's really timely as we start to understand what we need to do in response to that bill. How do we best use the resources that are made available for, for us across Warwickshire? And how does that support the priorities in the strategy that has just been presented to us? So I think it is an opportunity um, for us to work together and make sure that that resource is, is best used um, to support um, people who are um, experiencing domestic abuse um, and also that focus around um, homelessness and, and accommodation based support. So I just wanted to, to kind of share where we are at and there will be more information um, and engagement around that over the course of the next few months. Thanks Becky. Um, have I got any other, other speakers? Um, yes please Chairman, I did have my hand up. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, carry on. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, 
I do just want to say, thank, first of all, thank you for a great presentation. There was so much in there. The thing I just wanted to come on to was, was that Pathway project. It would seem to me that it's an ideal opportunity. I mean, unfortunate, someone's had to be admitted to hospital. It's an ideal opportunity to sort sort things out for them and try and get them on a better pathway. But um, obviously there are pressures in the hospital for discharge. And I wonder how that uh, that dichotomy is being is being addressed. Is there a sort of halfway house that people go to while we sort everything out? It seems terrible to think that people who have been ill are then discharged back onto the street. And uh, I just wondered how this works. How do you cope with the pressure on the hospitals alongside the need to sort out quite complex problems for these individuals? So if I if I could just come in on yeah. that sort of else. So the um the pathway needs assessments that um we're working on actually I guess quant tries to quantify the number of people who are considered as homeless who access um acute health services, whether that's through an emergency A and E admission or an inpatient admission. And as you rightly say, dealing with those individuals then when they're in hospital in A and E. Um, for all the will in the world, our NHS colleagues are not going to be able to solve everything and then kind of discharge them. There's real challenges there. So there's there's a few different ways that we're looking at that. One is to actually do the needs assessment to understand the numbers and the challenges that our health colleagues are dealing with. Um, but also we have got a hospital liaison um, service that is in operation at the moment, whereby we have um, three members of staff, um, one north, one rugby, one south, that work across the acute trusts and housing. So if somebody is in hospital and is not able to be um, discharged because there's um, an, a challenge with housing or homelessness or an adaptation issue, that hospital liaison officer will almost work as the intermediary between health and housing to try and solve some of those challenges. Um, so it's not a silver bullet, but it's definitely an approach that we're trying to build more support around those individuals. Sorry, just come back. Is there, is, is there somewhere these people can be discharged to rather than the street when uh, they've still got issues to be sorted out? I think there are opportunities for, um, you know, if, if you're still thinking, um, if somebody is um, clinically well, there um, are kind of step down bed opportunities. But even, even with those, there still needs to be a place for somebody to go to at the end of that um, and obviously districts and boroughs you know do everything in their powers to you know to be able to accommodate those individuals I guess sometimes there's challenges challenging circumstances that surround all of us and um, some of those individuals unfortunately you know will fall through that net and and that's why we're just so thankful in Warwickshire that we've got such a fantastic um, you know, partnership arrangement, working to support homeless individuals, including the community and voluntary sector. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, Margaret. John, you're back. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm really uh, come on to speak because of the oblique reference that Lisa made uh, to resources, and in particular the resources moving forward. And uh, it's been drawn to my attention that uh, uh, while Warwickshire County Council worked hard with us to develop this uh, strategy, this partnership, uh, they have at the same time cut the housing relation related support budget by one million pounds. No. 25% of the current budget, which will be introduced in 2024-5. And uh, it's a vital component in the homelessness prevention agenda. And without agencies such as P3 supporting vulnerable people in supported accommodation or floating support to help sustain tenancies, there is a, a real risk that homelessness will increase following these budget cuts. If I could just complete this, the actual wording in Whiteshire County Council report states redesign the housing related support offer, replace housing related support offer with appropriate care delivery consistent with standard council provision. 
and I don't think anyone knows what that actually means. The cut is 500,000 in 245 and 500,000 in 25.6. Is it possible we can have a detailed response on this issue so people can understand or the partnership can understand and certainly councillors could how this cut will be overcome by other means? Uh, I'm speaking in a sense out of past experience where in setting a budget for four years, very few words are put against very big impacts in terms of finance. And I, I suspect this is on a very large spreadsheet somewhere and has gone towards making up the council's next four-year budget plan. So I just wondered if, if it's possible to understand how this could all be reconciled with the excellent work that we've had a report on today. Yeah, I'll respond to that, John. Uh, that was a, a budget cut put put forward, which um, I, I discussed with officers um, and said it was not. But as, as part of those discussions, it was said to me uh, that um, there is uh, this this service needed uh, a relook and where it could be made more effective. That would be across homelessness and everywhere else we use it which is why the pause has been put into the budget so that the redesign and re uh, and the money needed can be properly assessed. Uh, so we have a modern uh, service uh, to, to deliver it. And that is why there is the pause. And at that point, the whole service, uh, when that uh, work has been done, which is why I've got two years, um, the whole service will be reassessed and, and, and the uh, resources it needs uh, will be up to date and looked at properly because that's a piece of work that now needs to be done. It is not a statutory service. It is a non-statutory service that Warwickshire provides. And the object of, of the pause, which I had put in for two years, um, flags up that this is a service that does need uh, a full review and effectiveness, which is what the words you've read out say. So that will happen um, at the start of the next municipal year. And will involve the people who have delivered the report today. It will involve everybody that, that yes. uses housing rate and support. That's our social services, um, all our borough and district housing, uh, and everybody else that uses that that service. Um, but like many services, it's due, it's due for review, um, and this is flagging it up. And they've got two years. Yeah. There's two years to get that work done. Yeah. And um, okay. And and see what. And also by then, um, the excellent homes and work will, will be um, also further on. And as Becky has indicated on the um, abuse and so on, there's so much work going on. This needs relating to all that work and seeing what the, uh, the real need and requirement is and, and what the service needs to look like. So that will happen, John, I can assure you. Thank you. Uh, and anyone else like, like to comment? In which case, uh, Lisa and Naomi, really, th sorry, Sally Bragg. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, obviously, I was going to echo some, some of uh, John's comments that he's just made. Obviously, we're really proud of the collaborative working with the districts and boroughs and, uh, you know, this multi-agency agency approach to actually uh, help homeless prevention. Um, I welcome your comments, Councillor Cable. And I really do think that this budget needs to be watched closely uh, to make sure that the services can be provided in the future. And thank you once again for this really good collaborative working on the contents of the report today. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, Ali. Um, I also just, just know on, on, on the chat that uh, Chris Bain has come, uh, put up that the final report on his excellent uh, rights of access project um, are on their website, so I urge everybody to to look at that. Did you want to comment on that, Chris? No, no, I, I think it will stand on its own. I'm happy to talk to people about what's in the report afterwards. Thanks, Chris. And thanks for that piece of work. It was very good. Uh, okay, okay then, so we've, we've a number of recommendations to note the contents and, and, and again thank Lisa and Emily and the partnership for all, for all they are doing. I believe this is one of our best of our Warwickshire partnerships um, that's got a grip of the subject, uh, knows where it's going, has got a great, great way forward. 
um, to agree to the strategic vision and recommendations as we've had them presented, uh, the true multi-agency approach, and welcome the comment um, from Dan, CWPT, on, 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 on the chat, and thank for, for their support. Uh, and support the Homelessness Strategic Group to develop a, a full action plan uh, to work towards the uh, for 2020-21-22. So, um, um, are we all in agreement with that? Because this is a project that the um, the board owns. We are the owners of this this uh, this project because it is multi agency. Are we all agreed? Looks like we are. There's no dissent. So, thanks very much. And um, Thank you very much, and we'll keep moving forward, though. Thank you, thank you really, very much. So we then just move on to our final item, which is the report of the subcommittee, um, which we uh, which we called um, to get the uh, Better Care Fund uh, back back to the necessary authorities. Um, at the end of the gentlemen, I'll move those as laid out. Are we all agreed? In which case, thank you very much. Thank you for your forbearance. Um, we are at the end of the meeting. Uh, thank you for all your support and help uh, over my time as chair. It has been a pleasure to chair this group. And I really feel collectively we have made a, dif a difference. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Jess.